Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Nightmare on Elm Street is a bona fide classic in the same pantheon as The Exorcist, Psycho, and Night of the Living Dead. Freddy certainly was a star, kind of the father figure who takes delight in killing innocents and delights in evil. He became a character in American horror, the equal of Frankenstein and Dracula. It just seemed like ancient tragedy in a way, so it felt very classical. It was about the story, and it was a really, really good story. This is a smart, interesting little movie. It deals with reality and fantasy blending. It was one of my very first jobs at all. I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. The scene in the bedroom where the girl is going up the wall. Nobody's ever really done that kind of thing before. No apologies, nothing politically correct about it. Push on the envelope, Wes Craven, come on down. Gonna get you. When I try to think of where becoming a horror film director came from, I can only speculate. Um, first of all, I never thought of making movies until I was almost 30. I was raised in a fundamentalist Baptist church. Almost all social things of any import were really within the church. And one of the beliefs they had, besides you can't play cards and dance and smoke and drink alcohol, was that you don't go to movies because they're kind of the devil's playground. My father was buried in 45, somewhere around my sixth birthday. The few memories that I have of my father, I was really scared of him. He had an explosive temper, and you had the feeling like he could kill you at any time. It was just, you know, one of those kind of guys. My first year in college, I came down with this very strange, unexpected paralysis. And during that time, when I came fairly close to death, I started writing poetry. That and my love of books and novels started going into writing short stories and things like that, but none of them were, you know, about horror. Films didn't really happen until I started teaching college. We had an art theater that showed all the European films, fantastic Bergman and Fellini films, this amazing sort of fluorescence of astonishing films. That was my notion, is I want to do something like that. Quit my job, I just went to New York to figure out how to make films. The whole idea of doing a horror film never would have occurred to me. Really, it just was a matter of my having been working for this guy, Sean Cunningham, who hired me to do some syncing up dailies. Around 1970 is when I first started to make films. I really didn't know how, and I was learning how to make all of these mistakes and how to make movies. In the middle of all of that, I meet this guy named Wes Craven. He was a rock. I mean, he was a terrific assistant, and he became a really good editor. After we had worked together for almost a year, it was like, I've got an idea, let's make a movie. We were able to get some people to put up money because of our previous relationship. Sean said, you know, the backers want a scary movie. Did you ever think of writing something scary? I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, go write something scary, and if they like it, uh, you can direct it. On a weekend, in three days, I wrote Last House on the Left kind of a raucous, balls-to-the-walls, escape criminals doing horrible things movie. The picture turned out to be very, very strong. You got to see Wes's special sensitivity for this scary, dark arena. I don't think Sean or I thought that anybody would really see it. When it opened, it kind of created a sensation, and there were riots and protests, and people tried to get into the projection booth to destroy it. I felt like, hey, maybe we got something here. After Last House was released, Wes felt that he had his sample reel and had a kind of a hit movie. Actually, after Last House, I didn't make another film for, I think, almost five years because I was trying to do other kinds of films. And then at a certain point, my friend said, I can get you money to make a scary movie, write something else scary. And that became Hills of Eyes. The Hills Have Eyes, another sort of strange, stark, semi-horror thing which he was able to get done. And at the same time, Wes had moved to California, was trying to make his career here and what got to do a couple of movies. Wes became a successful director, but he's still haunted by this idea of going back and trying to do this special movie. Nightmare was written after I'd done two films back to back. I had made enough money on them to um, you know, take six months off. So I basically took six months off and wrote and refined uh, the script, Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street as a story seems to have its roots in these articles in the Los Angeles Times. The first article was about a, a young man, Asian descent, uh, dying in the middle of a nightmare. He and the family had come out of relocation camps in Southeast Asia during the time of Pol Pot when hundreds of thousands of people were just being slaughtered. About a year later, there was a second article. Then about six months later, the third, and the third one just got me. 
That was a young man whose father was a doctor. They had come out of relocation camps. He was having nightmares and, and he was telling his family that there's something after me and I'm afraid if, if I don't stay awake, it'll kill me. This kid decided he was gonna stay awake. Sleeping pills the father had been demanding that he take were found under his pillow. He hadn't taken any of them. And he had a coffee pot in his closet full of black coffee with a long extension cord that he had hidden behind curtains. They were all sitting in the living room watching a movie and he just kind of fell asleep. Carried him upstairs, put him to bed, pulled the covers over him and everybody goes, thank God. Everybody goes to bed in the middle of the night, they hear screaming. They run into his room and before they get to him, he is dead. Oh man, there's, I gotta do a movie about that. There are so many horror films that have used the dream motif. If we go back to the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, the entire film is seen as a nightmare. They chose to make the sets distorted, expressionistic, nightmarish. But there was never a situation where a character lived exclusively in a dream world. Since I was in college, I've been writing down dreams and remembering my dreams, so I was kind of familiar with the whole landscape. I've always felt like nightmares are the horror movies of the psyche. Conversely, um, Horror films are kind of the nightmares of a culture. They talk about the things that uh, our normal rational mind or our polite society doesn't really want to bring to the dinner table. I was trying with Nightmare on Elm Street to think in archetypes. It was very much built on a system of kind of archetypical thinking and nightmares. It was right in there that Wes started to talk to me about this character that operated in dreams and was able to cross over into real life. Right away, I, I thought, you have to have an antagonist. You have to have the killer. And then it was a matter of just kind of designing him. By that time, Halloween had come out and Friday the 13th had come out, and they both were very powerful and successful films, and they had somebody in a mask. At a certain point, I thought, kill him in fire, and then he can have a mask of just scar tissue, and yet he'll be able to be articulate. Fred Krueger, Mom. Fred Krueger. Freddy the name was the name of a kid who used to beat me up quite frequently. <laughs> Kruger. It sounded very German and reminded me of one of the big war plants in Nazi Germany and also it was an extension of uh, Krug who was the lead character in Last House on the Left. Freddy's hat was exactly the hat of a man who had scared me when I was a little kid who uh, I think was a drunk walking down the street. He just somehow knew I was there and he stopped and he looked right at me and just held that. It just scared the shit out of me. His sweater colors were out of an article I read in Scientific American that these two colors were the most difficult for the human cornea or, or human eye to put side by side. The claws were the sort of BSD resistance and it was like, well, what does he have? Does he have a knife? Does he have a sickle? I think at that time we had a cat and I just saw the cat doing this. You know, I was like, oh yeah, right. You want to know who Fred Krueger was? He was a filthy child murderer who killed at least 20 kids in the neighborhood. The worst crime imaginable to me is to harm a child. The fact that he was a child murderer and a child molester was just about the most loathsome creature I could imagine on the level of what he did. <laughs> the big problem was, how do you fight somebody like that? It became a matter of having a central character, Nancy, that dared to go into the nightmares, go into his territory. That's when I started poking around lucid dreaming and, and that concept that you can go into a dream and be awake. And I just invented this little conceit that if you were holding something when you woke up, it would come with you back into your reality. I brought something out from my dream. I would tell it in about a minute and people would go, oh, I'd go see that in a second. <laughs> In the early 80s, I think Wes had his first draft of the script, and the agent had shopped it around. Most people just said, eh, I don't know if it'll work. I just, I just don't. Don't you have anything else? The only person that believed in it was Bob Shea. Bob was running New Line Pictures, which I think at the time was a 16 millimeter distribution company. At that time, Bob Shea and New Line Cinema were a tiny little, almost a storefront in lower Manhattan. That wasn't who I wanted to, you know, make the movie for 10 cents, so it went around to Hollywood too, but nobody got it uh, except Bob. I said I thought that sounded fantastic because it had an element that I'm always looking for, which is something that all audiences can relate to. Everybody, of course, could relate to scary dreams and nightmares. Bob absolutely believed that Wes was onto something, and he wanted a shot at the big time. The bad news is Bob didn't have any money. <laughs> he spent months and months, if not years, trying to get the money together to shoot this movie. 
with, with great pain and suffering, I will tell you that. As much as much the pain and suffering you go through making a film is nowhere near uh, the pain and suffering you go through financing it. In this case, I had to raise all the money outside. He raised the money basically, I'm sure, from his own money, and I'm sure from friends and family. And then he was looking for the major investor. Smart Egg was going to advance him a million dollars for the picture. A week later, he called me and said they dropped out. Just about two weeks before we started shooting, he basically said, you guys should all just go home and I'll call you <laughs> if I find money. And it was like, oh man, so close, you know. Bob told me, go back to L.A. and tell everyone that they're going to have to just work for free for a while. John Burroughs, our line producer, put up his own money. I'll use my credit card and I'll pay the crew. It was like eight or nine thousand dollars. Remember at that time, Bob has a thing about fingernails and, and kind of digging at them. And I looked over and they were all just bloody. And I realized the incredible amount of stress that comes from raising money and trying to put to get back into a picture. Somehow he found the money. We had one final meeting with Media Home Entertainment, a guy named Joe Wolf who owned that company and they were big home video distributors. Finally made a deal where Joe Wolf could take over the whole movie if I didn't get my commitment together in three or four weeks. I managed to then to go to the Smart Aid guy and uh, browbeat him into agreeing to put up the, the last few hundred thousand dollars. Bob didn't like it, but he had to take it. He was stuck. We went ahead and made the picture, but Bob will always remember that he was really giving his blood, <laughs> you know. He said, John, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. The casting director was Annette Benson. She started bringing in people for Wes to talk to. You know, you make a lot of decisions when you start off uh, on a film in casting that you're going to be married to, and if you make one wrong decision, it can just kill the film. Nancy was played by this young woman who walked into the casting office, Heather Langenkamp. There was just nothing pretentious about her, but she was smart. She had an open face. She had a strong face. I remember the interview really well because it was the scene where I'm describing how my dream had had this guy in it with fingernails, and I remember, you know, making that sound. Nancy. I remember looking at Wes, and he just, I could tell he really liked it. He knew immediately that Heather was the right look, because he wanted a young girl who was smart looking, obviously pretty, vulnerable, but clearly had a good head on her shoulders. I'm into survival. The character that I love the most and have identified with the most is Nancy Thompson. She had a great sense that she could solve problems without anybody's help at all. I try to be like her, actually. <laughs> Nancy definitely was this good girl, and her best friend, Tina, you get the feeling like she just isn't going to make it. When Wes cast me as Tina, I just completed my acting program. My agents at the time called and said, you have an audition for um, this horror film. The thought behind it was that I'd be the sort of Janet Lee character, and in the first couple scenes of the film you would think that I was going to be the heroine. That was obviously his lead, it was going to be his heroine. Uh, you found out a lot about her and then he killed her. The device shown just to make it clear that I'm not going to be the heroine. Obviously when I die, <laughs> that's a clear indicator. Rob was played by Nick Corey. Guys can have nightmares too, you know. He was a very interesting actor. He had a lot of soul, I thought, and a lot of empathy. I probably could have saved if I don't move sooner. He felt like he could play a character who wasn't a bad guy, but he hadn't had the breaks that everybody else had had. Johnny Depp had never acted, and Wes liked him and liked his look. Hi, how you doing? It came down to three guys. Johnny Depp was one, and it was just a name. She said, well, I'm thinking of this guy, which is not Johnny, and my daughter and her friend said, Dad, Johnny Depp. Oh, he's sexy. He's so sexy. He's a dreamboat. Sexy and hot and good-looking. His was a little bit more of a goody-two-shoes character than I'm sure he was in real life. You know, he played such a pure as the driven snow kind of guy. Why would anybody want to kill me? Johnny had never been, to my knowledge, in front of a camera before. I won't screw up. He was just terrified that he wasn't doing a good job. Woo! You know, after we were shooting him, I said, Johnny, you're doing great. One of the conditions when we got the rest of our money was that we needed to have a name, at least a name or two, so that we could sell the picture foreign. We were so excited by the fact that John Saxon was willing to do it. 
John Saxon came on board and he was quite a name at that time. He was a very well-known actor and he had been part of the Hollywood studio system before it was disbanded in the 60s. He was a heartthrob when I was growing up in Caldwell, Idaho. He was the kind of actor that girls sent away for the 8x10 glossy. How you doing, baby? He played my dad perfectly and I felt very secure at all times when I was around him and acting with him. Ronnie Blakely played Nancy's mother. Are you okay? She had been in Nashville, the Robert Altman film. Fred Krueger can't come after you, Nancy. He's dead. Ronnie Blakely, she had an incredible life. She'd hung out with Bob Dylan, and she had been nominated for an Academy Award. When I met Wes Craven, I was somewhat surprised to see that he was such an elegant, soft-spoken man. It was a thrill to work with him, and, and he couldn't have been nicer. Are you okay? I'm okay. I felt very close and friendly with Heather and admired her a great deal, so we hit it off very well. We actually did spend a day or two together before the shoot where we went out and shopped for prom dresses at the Galleria, pretending that she was my mom at the mall. I loved this scene in the kitchen where she's treating me like I am crazy. She slaps me. Ronnie really slapped me. We both were very buried in that scene. The casting of Freddy was a really big deal. I mean, it would rise and fall on Freddy. My first thought was that uh, because of the physicality of the role, I should go with somebody who was like a stuntman. It was very quickly apparent that they were not in connection with that part of <laughs> their psyche at all. And then in comes Robert Englund. I think I'd done maybe 12 movies before I did Nightmare on Elm Street, but what happened to me was I finally stepped into television. I did this miniseries called V, which was sort of breakout for me. That was sort of my first taste of celebrity. In my hiatus from that, that's when I auditioned for Nightmare on Elm Street. My buddy smoked, and he'd ridden over with me, and I'd use some ash from the ashtray in my car, which is an old makeup theater trick, and put a little bit of circles under my eyes. It looks very, very real. You can fool people with it. I just sat there and stared back at Wes. Wes came out of the meeting and Robert had left and he told me, he said, you know, he said, this man can do this. He was just full of piss and vinegar and he just loved the role. And he said, I just can't wait to sink my teeth into this. When Wes started shooting Nightmare, there was enormous pressure on him because he had believed in it for so long and now it was sort of like put up or shut up. And he was working with an insufficient budget and a very short shooting schedule trying to figure out how to do it. I think we had something like 32 days. It was tight. It was very, very tight. You know, as a director, you just never know whether you can cram all of that, uh, you know, 10 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag. It was a small budget movie that pretended to be a big budget movie with multi units. We did not have a lot of time for what we had to do. But we found very talented people who were willing to work for the money we had and were able to take a few thousand dollars and turn it into a bed spurting blood or something like that. Cinematographer was Jacques Haken, an absolute perfectionist. He wore an eye patch when he was shooting, and when we asked him why he did that, he said, because I don't want to close my eye, but I don't want any distractions, so the eye that was not to the lens had an eye patch. He was one of these cameramen that in the screening room when we ran the dailies, he'd run up to the screen from his seat. Oh my God, look at the lighting over here in this corner. But his work was good. His work was beautiful. Wes had dreamt up all kinds of weird things and he would get together with Haken. He and Wes were working very tightly together to get what they wanted. We do plan shots. There's a lot of storyboarding involved and it's very premeditated but you still have to leave room open for free thinking. You see a hand and your eye is drawn to it, there's your close-up to the glove. And watch Robert Englund, you know, sort of flip out in that makeup and go, Where, where's the heat? And make sure we get that on the film. The shooting was done at Desilu Studios, what used to be the old Desilu that some independent equipment house had purchased. We rented the space and we actually built the whole house on the stage, first and second floor. Then we shot in West Hollywood. There's a wonderful little street called Genesee that when you pull onto it, it's like you're in the Midwest. It just has beautiful overarching trees. So that was our exterior location. It's a very noticeable house. I do remember it really vividly. 
A lot of the scenes at that front door and the rose bushes and the trellis, I do hope those people forgave us for anything that we broke. The neighborhood was very upset at us. There weren't too many films going around on the streets in those days. Then they became interested in the picture when they saw a shooting at night and when Freddy was out walking around. Oh, look at him. There he is. There he is. I told you what a gruesome. And so we were starting to get crowds coming around. <laughs> And then we shot in Venice, California, some of the back alley stuff. Ah! I've often thought, I wonder what all those neighbors thought in the middle of the night, because I was screaming at the top of my lungs running down this alley. The boiler room was a power plant of the Lincoln Heights jail. We went down and looked at the basement, and it was just perfect. We looked at a lot of boiler rooms, and most of them were very clean and kind of, you know, contemporary, and I wanted something very dungeon-like. And this one just fit the bill. It was just creepy. I mean, it was clearly a place filled with so much anguished emotion. God only knows what happened in there. All the pipes had been wrapped in this insulation, and it was all broken open, and this stuff was falling out. A year later, we discovered that the place had been closed down because it was just full of asbestos, and I realized we were all in there sucking up asbestos for like a week. It's guerrilla filmmaking. One had to really be prepared and stay immersed in what you were doing because the whole movie is special effects. I just kind of assumed that that's the way movies were made in Hollywood, you know? Only lately when I see like how the A-list stars are treated, and I'm like, wow, that was really low budget, wasn't it? But I had nothing to compare it to, so I was perfectly happy. We laughed a lot on the set. You know, in a horror movie, there's so many ludicrous things going on with the stage blood and the makeup and the melodramatic style of acting sometimes that you really have to embrace because everything around you is larger than life. But you kind of got to giggle, and Wes certainly knows that and encourages a little bit of that, so then you can get down to business. <laughs> Freddy's makeup, of course. Wes Craven, he gave me the original script and basically gave me a little description of what he thought Freddy should look like. I did five different sculptures of what I thought Freddy should look like based on burn makeups. You know, I did a lot of research. Wes kind of mixed and matched different things on each sculpture, and then we came up with a final look. When I first showed Robert, he was just excited. It was going to be a lot of fun to play this character. <laughs> I thought, the makeup is so extensive that I need some humanity. And my eyes, my darting little beady eyes will be the humanity. It took three hours. I think it was about 11 different pieces we had to glue down. Because I had under pieces that glued down to, that showed the muscle. And then over that, I put melted flesh kind of pieces. And I wanted it to move independently so you'd see his muscles moving underneath. When he first got into it, he was, he was, it was almost like he was afraid to move around like it was going to fall off or something. And he goes, this is amazing. It, it, it all holds together and it moves. And he started moving his mouth around and moving his eyebrows. And he was just all excited after that. I remember the first time I saw Robert Englund wearing his Freddy makeup. It was so strange. I did not know what special effects makeup could do to a person. It was just so gruesome and so like shiny and oozy. He couldn't get out of it once he was in it. So for example, if we ate lunch, there Freddy would be having lunch which isn't exactly what you want to see across the lunch table. It got very difficult for Robert towards the end because his face was nearly raw from all the makeup. It got to the point where at the end of the day, he wouldn't even wait for me to come and take it off carefully with solvents and things. He would just rip the whole mask off. This is God. The famous glove, Freddy Krueger's glove. The original description in the script was fairly loose. Wes had a vision sort of in his mind of what it could do, but not how it was. He made the suggestion that it needs to be something that the guy could make himself with the things that you find in a boiler room. I did a sketch, a side view sketch of what the whole thing would look like just to work out the geometry, how's this thing going to move, where the rivets need to be, how does it attach to the glove. And then I handed the work off to Lou Carlucci and Charlie Bellardinelli, who were two of my guys, to actually build the glove itself. We wanted to use a commercially available knife. This little Echo steak knife was the most brutal looking thing. Reground, remounted on the glove to make those long talons. I remember the first time Robert tried the glove on. First thing he did was cut himself, like everybody did, because we didn't realize that if you folded your fingers all the way, the knives went into your wrist. But then he sort of looked at Wes and got that smile on his face and went, 
That became his look with the glove. Gonna get you. I really began to play with it. You know, and that would be what happened to me. I remember playing around in craft service and goofing in craft service with it, you know, putting different, you know, jujubes and marshmallows and putting jelly on it, making it look like guts and stuff like that. That's when I really got comfortable with it and really began to really get it into the frame. It's got to be the scariest looking thing. It just looks so homemade. It looked like something that some psychopath would have made. They had several different ones. They had sharp ones and plastic ones and non-sharp ones. And whenever Freddy would grab me, I'd say, this is the not sharp one, right? You know? And often, they would forgotten to switch him out. He's like, oh no, this is the sharp one. Yeah, it caught us a lot of nightmares. It was very strange to see Robert interact with people. He went from being this nice guy and, and real talkative and everything, and then all of a sudden you'd hear action. You'd see this whole dark cloud come over. Hey, Marker. Once he put it all on, he sort of got into the character. He enjoyed playing that part. He relished it. Tina, watch this. I could tell that there was a really strong actor playing the role. There was something there that was going to be a real-life breathing character. Robert England was a classically trained actor at the Royal Academy. He really brought this character to life as if he was playing a Shakespearean role. He would practice movements that would be extremely dramatic. There's so much drama to every single line that he delivered. What I took was Klaus Kinski. I was really impressed with his Nosferatu. And I took the thrusted neck that Klaus did on that. And then the other one was, there was a certain kind of, you know, a you dirty rat kind of swagger that Jimmy Cagney had that I wanted to bring to Freddy. Sometimes even walking crossover, like a surfer walks on a surfboard or like a runway model. It gives Freddy a kind of a glide. I remember seeing there once and Johnny and Heather were sitting there getting makeup on as if they needed it, these two beautiful young kids. And here I am, and I'm getting basted with a turkey baster full of KY jelly. I envied them. I envied them their youth. I envied their beauty. A light bulb went off. I could use this as Freddy. It was a shorthand for me to get angry. I'm gonna split you in two. This was a guy that knows what's in your underwear drawer. This is a guy that knows what you're afraid of. This is a guy who knows what's in your diary. This is a guy that knows your weakness and can exploit that. And that's a real violation. Look, all better for me, <laughs> but not for you. Wes Craven had a tremendous mind for effects. He was so good. I could sit there and he'd tell me what he's going to do and I'd say, well, we can't shoot that, Wes. We can't. Jim Doyle was our effects man. When Wes would talk to him, he'd understand. Nightmare was a low, low, low budget movie for what they were attempting to do especially. I think we had 80 effect shots in a 90 minute film. Wes, being an experienced low-budget director at that point, was able to use the budget to his advantage. My feeling about special effects were twofold. One, I, I wasn't terribly expert in it. And two, I couldn't afford them anyway. So everything was pretty much practical, which is a film term for just done physically. We worked our way through ideas for some of these nightmares that would give him the bang on the screen. Every scene has some really innovative effect in it. Wes was always the instigator. Any idea would be great. Okay, how are we going to make that today? The very first one was in the alleyway when Freddy's arms stretch across the alley. The idea seemed so simple, and yet the effect was so bizarre. It was just something that you weren't expecting at all. Oh, the alley scene, yes, yeah, so that was very high tech. His arms stretching out were literally a guy on two garage roofs, one on each side of the alley with a fish pole. They were air assisted to be able to extend, and then they were just marionetted from two guys with fishing pole rigs, one in each garage on each side. That's as complicated as that had to be. Freddy's face getting pulled off, that was a puppet. I had to build a whole puppet of Robert, head and torso, and I had to put his face on, but I couldn't glue it down because it had to smear off, like really easy. So I just used KY jelly and just loaded it in there on the skull face. I think it was one take, just much of that stuff was just very, very, very simply done. Simple one was he wanted to have a figure pressing against the wall, the wall then showing the whole figure of the man. I said, how are we going to shoot that? 
that scene, they literally, I remember it in the morning, they're like, how, how are we going to do this? And Jim Doyle's like, well, I really think we should just go out and buy this new material. It's called spandex. Yeah, the rubber wall that everybody thinks is rubber. I went off down the fabric store and got spandex. So then we just made a panel of it, stuck it over the bed, and pushed on it a couple times, and it was like, hmm, this might work. That would be me. That would be my face is Freddie in that particular shot. As he stirs. I think that's my hero shot. Freddie's got to come back. We didn't know what it would look like, just, so just press your face against it and press your hand out. And we'll see how it looks. And it, we looked at it like, whoa, that's really terrific. But, you know, it cost 10 cents. And of course, the bathtub scene, which is probably people's favorite scene, just that idea of the claw coming up through the water between my legs while I'm sleeping in the bathtub. How are we going to do this? Parker. Well, you're going to be on this little box in the bathtub, and then we're going to have Jim Doyle from underneath. He's going to, you know, stick the claw up through the bath water bubbles. I'm like, okay, you guys have obviously thought about this more than I have. It actually, it, it wasn't a difficult thing to do. We just cut a hole under the bathtub, cut a hole in the bathtub, sealed a tank below. And action. I just held my breath and just would you know duck under the water when Wes said action and I was and I could hear him because he was right next to the wall so I could hear him through the wall Mark? and I just took Mark? it took cues from it right too high and had to be really 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 careful because that was the sharp glove and up I loathe to admit that's not me between Heather's legs in the tub and this Jim Doyle again working 24/7 no get up Jim ready okay, okay. Jim ready take your breath and action Jim as soon as he's under, I'll start. Yell action, I guess. So. Yeah. As soon as you're ready, Jim. Action. Underwater. That was all done at a pool with black plastic sheeting so that you couldn't tell how deep the pool was. It looked like it went forever down there. We all went under that vis queen on scuba equipment. We all thought we were going to drown. We all oh yeah, just thought this is the most dangerous thing we've ever done. There are some props that the special effects guys bring onto the set. I think Wes invents these kinds of things to just get me. I have to get over that, and it usually takes me a couple of minutes. I was in the lab one day putting the phone together with the mouth and the mechanical tongue. It was a cable-operated tongue device so he could make it go up or down, left and right, and pull it in and out. It was just you know, like a simple prop, you know, and all it did was just that. Then when I saw how it worked, and I saw the line that was going to be read, I knew that that would become one of the most famous lines from the movie. It just had all the ingredients of being one of those great movie lines. The thing I walked away the most from the entire film was that Ready? I felt that it was a film about blood. <laughs> there was like every scene was too much blood, not enough blood, the blood's not red enough, the blood's too sticky, the blood's too thin, cue the blood, more blood, less blood, splash the blood. I clearly had read it and, and interestingly enough not really processed some of the more adventurous things I was going to have to do. One day on the set, a prop guy came up to me and was like, oh, now I just wanted to show you the body bag. And I'm like, all right, like, I don't want you showing me. That was awful being in that body bag. Your psyche does not want to be in that bag. You hear about body bags, you're just not supposed to be in one. Also because I was sharing it with creatures. I had to stand in this bag with these things. It was just awful. I was terrified and grossed out and I thought, this is just awful. Centipede, wait, I don't remember reading that in the script. They shot with my, my face with a rubber centipede, me pushing it out, and then they used the cast face with a real centipede. I don't know what this has to do with acting, and <laughs> I don't think I want to do this. The biggest thing in the picture was the revolving room. The upside-down room that they used with Tina, who was shown to be on the ceiling. I had no idea how they were going to do that when I saw the script. I'm still not absolutely clear how they did do it on production. It was critical that Tina's death had to be something that was completely otherworldly and completely confusing to the audience. The idea actually came from the Fred Astaire film Royal Wedding, which had a great sequence of him dancing around the rotating room. You can do that? I said, well, I think we can. So I went, went ahead and looked at the, the 
logistics. So yeah, I, th I think we can do this. We spent a month to get this thing done, built the framework and then built the room inside of that. All sorts of superstructure underneath because it had to kind of have a structural integrity no matter what attitude it was in. Floors, walls, ceiling, everything is framed in two by sixes and double layer plywood because nothing can move. Every little thing had to be reconsidered. What are the decorations in the room? How are we going to nail them down when the room turns? Everything in the room, all the curtains, anything that would flop or move was just starched to hell or pinned down. We strapped Amanda's boyfriend down to the floor. We had his hair totally lacquered. And then there were two kind of jump seats that were bolted to the wall, and the camera was bolted to the wall. The cameraman had himself strapped into a chair, and he kept the camera on and he went around with the room. We turned the room by hand, me and three or four guys. It was very spooky when it was turning all by itself. It was horrifying. I mean, it was the only scene I think I've ever been part of that was more frightening in real life. What if it falls off its hinges? Or what if somebody falls out of the hole and lands on the ground? It just seemed like so much could go wrong. I was pretty scared going into that. I was afraid for my own physical safety because I kept thinking things were going to fall on me. I thought I was going to fall out. This has a lot of elements to it that seem really dangerous. We shot the whole sequence and it just dragged Amanda up the wall. It just was the spookiest thing in the world. The only thing was as soon as anybody walked into the room, they got totally nauseous because it was so disorienting. I look up and there's the bed above me. Completely freak out, I get complete and utter vertigo and I start to feel that I'm falling. Wes's head comes through this hole in the floor and he's like, look, I am standing on the floor. This is my head. You're on the floor. You're looking right at me. Amanda, this is, this is down, this is up, this is down, this is up, just before the take. And action. <laughs> no! No! <laughs> Roar! Roar! Just the most bizarre thing I've ever been asked to do. <laughs> it was a mess doing the whole thing. And then we took the same room and used it as Johnny Depp's room for the bed sequence. The part pulling him down through the bed was easy, but then when the mother comes in and sees all the blood come out, we inverted the room. It's actually inspired by Kubrick a little bit, because The Shining had come out, and there was that scene with the blood spilling out of the elevators. And I thought if he could get away with it, I could. Roughly 220 gallons of the blood, as we called it. This was actually made with water, with food coloring and a little bit of poster paint to make it thick. It was stored on a scaffolding above the stage. Imagine it's like a lottery drum. And there's a platform with guys waiting at the top. The drum turns, and when it hits the mark, boom, and that's the bed. Nobody could see anything, because the room was all closed. All we could hear was this thunderous pounding on the floor, which was now the ceiling, of all this blood dumping into the room. It was probably about 30 of the most exciting seconds. I've had on a, on a film set. The stunt coordinator was Tony Caesar. He did some really hard falls. There's a scene where Freddy gets knocked by the sledgehammer and falls backward over the railing. I thought he had broken his neck for sure because his body rotated and he just turned his head sideways a split second and hit that thing like a ton of bricks. The whole <laughs> plywood, which was like you know, three-quarter inch plywood, was cracked. His specialty was burn scenes, where he would paint his body with flamant and light himself. This guy was supposedly one of the top body burn guys in the business. This guy's nuts. Uh, he's, he's good. He knows what he's doing. He did what he said was the longest fire burn done to that time when uh, Freddy was caught on fire in the basement and runs up the stairs. I couldn't believe this guy was actually doing this. It, it's nuts. We're sitting there with the fire extinguishers. When is he going to stop? He rolls back down the stairs on fire. Nobody'd ever done that before. Gets up, starts back up the stairs. And we're like, oh, okay. Finally, he went down, hot enough, and we put him out. They put him out and he stood up and said, how'd it go? <laughs> so he was pretty amazing. At the end, you know, as we were finally winding down, and I'm sure the money was running out, there were some days where there were some extra people on the set kind of looking at us, and I got the sense like, okay, these must be money people, and they, they must be nervous that we're not done yet. In the middle of all of this, I was talking to Wes and asking him how it was going, and he was telling me about the shortage of time and money and so on, and I volunteered to come in and try to shoot second unit to pick up shots, and I said, look, just tell me what you need, and I'll go try to get the shots. 
You'd work for 12 or 14 or 15 hours and you wouldn't get everything that was on the call sheet. My day-to-day -day concerns were keeping, the, keeping people working. We had a growing discontent with the crew because we were falling behind. I asked Bob, what do I do? I've never produced before. I, I've never represented a studio on a production. Bob said, just keep pacing back and forth, looking at your watch, and sign. <laughs> One day, we were doing an inside scene where I was running through the alley and I'm being pursued by Freddy. Cut my foot open, and I remember Bob Shea going like, do you really have to go, get, go to the hospital and get stitches? I'm like, I think I do. Oh, this actress, gosh. So what, her foot is bleeding a little bit. The scene where Heather puts her foot in the carpet and it sinks through, that was one of my dreams, one of the horrible dreams that I had had when I was a kid. Wes said, okay, Bob, this is your idea. If you think it's so great, why don't you direct this scene? Yeah, well, no, it was one of the times that Bob visited the set, and it was towards the end, very, very end of the shoot, and I think it was about the time he was getting ready to pull the plug. <laughs> Bob was standing right behind me saying, you got to shoot, you got to shoot, you can't do the, the cut the scene, cut the scene. I said, Bob, why don't you direct it? Wes deigned to let me do it, mostly because if somebody didn't do it, it wouldn't have happened, and I thought it was an important part in the movie. The ending of the film was a huge conundrum. Wes wanted Heather to come out of the house, turn to her mother and say, well, my God, I had this very strange dream last night, and then go off to school. But I didn't think as a commercial matter, it was the kind of thing that was going to work. In the good horror films I've seen, there's always a, a, a twist at the end that scares you a lot. I begged him to write some kind of twist. Ready, go, ready, and action. Bob wanted a car to pull up and Nancy to get into it and then see Freddie at the wheel. We had a lot of arguments about that. Wes said, that's terrible. Well, it's, we can't get, it's really bad. You're screwing up the whole thing. And so he tried, and I tried, and we all were working on different things. It is a little disconcerting shooting all sorts of different endings as an actor. Who's in charge here? You know, let's just make an ending. Let's just get this over with. Bob wanted to have a hook for a sequel. I thought it was demeaning to the picture and didn't need it and all those things. But I also, I have to say, was very grateful to Bob for making the picture possible. So we reached a compromise. Freddie wouldn't be driving, but the car itself would have Freddie's stripes. And then you cut to the mother, which is one of my favorite things. <laughs> Bob, we have to have this last shot of you know pulling Ronnie Blakely through the door. You don't need that shot. Give us one shot. OK, you can have one shot. And so we rolled, and that thing just flew through that. I don't know how they did it, but you know it was one take, and we were out of there. We shut down, and that was, that was it. The editing was done in New York. That was obviously because we didn't even have an office out here at this point. The first time I saw the film, Bob and the editor and I sat in a screening room and they rolled the film. <coughs> film finished and the lights came up and there was a long pause and then Bob turned around, put his arm over the chair, I'll never forget this, and looked at me and said, do you think there's a film there at all? <laughs> I said, yeah. I think we cut for, I don't know, four or five weeks. Suddenly this terrific film emerged was intense but uh, very very exciting the big challenge was how much to show of him physically we didn't want to overdo it in terms of the scary thing in the movie being too much in your face and of course his voice was so good as well that he was able to create tension without seeing him one of the really effective things about this movie is that when you're shifting between the nightmares and dreams and actual reality, it's not that obvious. I thought it was great what Wes was doing because half the time I couldn't tell what was a dream and what was uh, reality, even in the dailies. It fed in beautifully into what we tried to do editorially, which was kind of seamlessly go from reality into dreams. I think it played into the movie in a really wonderful way so that often you wouldn't quite know where you were. The sound of Freddy's fingers rubbing on metal. Wes spent quite a bit of time with the sound editors getting just the kind of sound that would make your spine tingle. Then we hired a composer, Charles Bernstein, who turned out to be brilliant. <laughs> This was a very low budget situation. So our early conversations were uh, kind of about how we were gonna do this thing on very little money. I suggested to Wes, maybe I'll do this thing at home and I'll play all the instruments and I'll sing all the parts. I, I think I can do this thing without an orchestra. I wanna have a theme 
to the music uh, that is unmistakable and that we can have reoccurring throughout. And I had written this little doggerel thing uh, in the film, uh, one, two, Freddy's coming for you, three, four, better lock your door. I said, maybe you could set that to music. Da, 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 da. It's very thematic, but I wanted it to have a melody. Da, da, de, da, 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 da. We had to deal with the rating board, which made us cut some things they didn't like. You know, I tend to block bad memories, but I do remember that the whole blood coming out of the bed had to be cut short, and I know that we had to cut short Amanda when she hit the bed. There was a big splash of blood. They made us cut that off very short. It was extremely painful, extremely painful to have to do that. I still, to this day, hate edit, um, that sort of censorship. I really started getting excited when we took the film to MIFED in Milan, which is a foreign film sales convention. All of the skeptical investors and home video people and all the yadda yadda yadda, all of a sudden they would get very quiet when they walked out. Everybody had a sense that this was a film that was really going to work. Everything is together. We've got a release date. Publicity was out and the TV spots and everything had been done. It was a big deal for us. The week before we were supposed to open, the lab we were using wouldn't release the negative because they hadn't been paid. We didn't have the money to pay them. Bob somehow worked out some kind of deal to pay the lab all of their costs. Bob got the movie made because otherwise there would have been no prints on the screen. <laughs> That weekend the film did well. I think it was number one. Beyond any expectation, it just became a big hit. Wes was a wonderful director, and Bob Shea is fabulous. We have a new producer in town. It's a hit. People were lining up down Broadway to see this movie. It was like live theater. I mean, people were running down the aisles, talking to the screen. Don't go there, don't go up the stairs, you know, girlfriend. Don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep, he's behind you. They were seeing something that they had never seen before. It was a confirmation of all these things that Wes had been trying to make people understand for years. He was so right. As it played, its reputation grew. All over the country. It wasn't just a New York movie or a Los Angeles movie. Nightmare on Elm Street played for everybody in all cultures because everybody has to fall asleep at night. It became a cultural phenomenon. I did a show once uh, with Robert, and as soon as Robert walked out, the kids stood up and started chanting, Freddy, Freddy. I have never liked him in the way that his fans liked him. I always felt like he was like the sickest, most depraved, disgusting, evil, devil character. That's what's wrong with our world. <laughs> Are the Freddy Kruegers in our world? I was watching television one night, and the President of the United States referred to Freddy Krueger. The truth is that when you take a walk down our opposition's memory lane, it starts to look like Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> it's become part of the culture. You have no control over that, and it goes where it's going to go. Through video, it had such a huge following. That's when people would come up to me, and I was like, oh my gosh. There's millions of fans now. They just love every single moment of that film, and they've memorized every line. This is just a dream. This isn't real. And then there's girls who really love Nancy and are inspired by her strength. It's just amazing to me. I don't think it's an accident that A Nightmare on Elm Street would come to be made in the mid-80s. We had AIDS, we had uh, an economy that was going to collapse, and in the midst of this you get this vision, all right, we're going to show you Elm Street. It's the disintegrating middle class, the single parents, and alcoholic parents, and neglectful parents. Freddie's punishing white bread America. This is a film about people being put in jeopardy by lies. You knew about him all this time? And you've been acting like it was something I made up? Freddy wants to destroy you because you are innocent and you are youth and you have your whole life ahead of you. Freddy kind of spits the last minutes of adolescence back in the faces of his victims. You die. Freddy Krueger is in everybody's mind the boogeyman. You think of Freddy Krueger. I always think Freddy's in the parking lot when I'm walking in my car at night. You know, I hear an elevator and I think Freddy's gonna step out of it. <laughs> I dream of Freddy all the time. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. 